All right, clap. <laughs> The best time to write is now. The best place to write is Here. The best person to write is You Thank you very much You're welcome People and persons, beings of all ages Ladies and gentle, gentle dams Welcome to Stories, Sketches, and Sounds and Writing Nights Press presents THE Poetry Open Mic with our guest poet, Daria Quinn, at the outpost on State Route 43, Kent, Ohio. Just want to let everybody know, we have some Writing Nights merchandise over there on that table with the blue uh, dress on. And the, uh, we have an open mic list of recorded and not recorded, so if you want to be on the Facebook Live pop, uh, simulcast, it's happening right now. Sign on the recorded. If you don't, let me know. Uh, we also uh, we have a $5 suggested donation, which will go towards writing nights to pay the feature for tonight. Um, I'm not going to waste much of your time. I'm just going to tell you, uh, introduce our feature poet for the night. Queer feminist, local superhero, and sarcastic bitch, Daria Quinn. Hello, my name is Daria Quinn. I am a poet, writer, and performer based in Canton, Ohio. And uh, um, most of my work is e either uh, politically or identity based. So trigger warning, pretty much all the terrible things you could possibly hear in life. <laughs> Bad stuff. Woo. All right, so we're, we're, we're going to go ahead and start with, we're going to start with some poetry and then we'll Move on to a few other things. <sighs> Why must you mix politics with your art? Don't you ever write about things that make you happy? Well, what makes me happy is smashing patriarchy while asserting myself as a valid human being. LGBTQ rights mean everything to someone who just happens to be LGBTQ, and that happens to be me. So yeah, talking about that makes me happy. Too many people try too hard to pretend that people like me don't exist. They close their ears and their eyes. And so I like it when I make it impossible to ignore that people like me are real and just as human as them. Well, maybe. I'm not always sure. I, I find it hard to believe that Nazis aren't pure evil, wrapped up in skin, pretending to be people. Like, dressed up like wolves, passing off as sheep, and a mile-long smorgasbord of things they'd like to eat. So maybe I don't care about being civil to a bunch of assholes that would rather see me dead than to be the queer transgender woman here before you. I'm done pretending to be nice to the fanatical right-wing Bible thumpers. <laughs> and I'm sick of your sick revision of Jesus that you never got right. Never mind the fact that you think was fucking white. <laughs> Fuck you all. You will never win. Queers are like Hydra, a dragon you can't slay. Cut off a head and two more will go back in its place. The more you cut your, the more you clutch your pearls, the more brazen I become. Because making me mad is how I get my kicks. You want a happy poem? This is it. And that's why I mix art with politics. All right. In my experience as a performer, I've actually found it rather uncommon for me to be performing above ground. So <laughs> this, this is a poem about that. This is uh, also loosely inspired by the Ramon song, Hey Daddy O, I don't want to go down to the basement. <clears throat> hey Daddy O, I don't want to go down to the basement. They make you think down there about queer rights and black lives and how women are people just like you. Hey Daddy O, I don't want to go down to the basement. 
I'd rather stay upstairs with all the bestsellers, books about vampires and kinky sex and girls on fire. I love me some fictionalized girl power, but I don't want to go down in the basement where the real girl power is stored. Feminism ain't for me. I can go see the Black Panther movie, but I don't want to read about no real Black Panthers now, do I? No. Black lives only matter to me on a movie screen. Hey, daddy I don't want to go down to the basement. They make you think down there. Where the books that no one reads live. No Pennywise or Sauron's eyes, just the stories for all the queer eyes. Not for the straight guys, but for the queer guys. Stories of a community, fictional and otherwise, that you don't want to see. Because, hey, Daddy-O, I don't want to go down to the basement. The poetry hurts down there. They slam and confront and talk about all the things that everyone wants to bury. Like queer rights, black lives, and how women are people just like you. These books gather dust and why the poet's voice gets drowned out by the bestsellers we sell upstairs. Fifty shades of white privilege and multicultural erasure. Everybody poops, but not everybody's shit gets published. Some of us are lucky we ever made it to paper at all. Stored down in the basement where white eyes and privileged minds will never have to see us. Because, hey, yo, I don't want to go down in the basement. When I was offered this gig, it was um, suggested to me that I bring something of a uh, storytelling nature. So this is, this is uh, brand new. I've never performed this in front of anybody, and quite frankly, I wrote most of it today. So. New shit? Yeah, yeah new shit. shit. Yeah. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and make sure that these pages don't stick together. <sighs> the pulse shooting really changed things for me. Up to that point, I was mostly a closeted trans person attempting to stay invisible in the real world. Meanwhile, social media allowed me to be the person I knew I truly was. I wasn't happy this way, but it was a marked improvement over the previous few years, when Leela Alcorn's suicide affected me so much that I finally had to confront the lingering questions I had about my own gender. I knew that if I kept ignoring this, I'd end up like her distraught, alone, and dead, having never been, never truly been myself. Personal setbacks saw me embrace both a bisexual and non-binary label to describe my sexual and gender identity because I never felt, and in many ways still don't feel, that I could handle the pain of a medical transition. I knew, the, I knew these weren't accurate terms. I don't, I'm not, I'm very much a lesbian, but because of my attractions, also extend to femme-leading non-binary folk and other non-men. Claiming to be a mere lesbian would be a bit of a misnomer. Plus, as a trans woman surrounded by forces that will never accept you as feminine, adop adopting the term lesbian seemed to come with its own set of problems. Conversations in lesbian Facebook groups would often lead to arguments over the nature of general preferences giving me the impression that cisgender lesbians are never going to accept me as one of them. To this day, I still don't feel that the lesbian community truly has my back on anything more than an individual level. And it's been made clear to me over several years of experience interacting with cisgender lesbians that even the most intersectional and accepting of them will probably still never date a trans woman based on nothing more than blatant transphobia. In other words, I'm wasting my time trying to be a part of the community and potential dating pool that doesn't want me here. And I'm wasting emotional currency trying to earn an acceptance that will never come. Calling myself non-binary felt like a fair, non-committal way of being open about my gender identity without having to deal with the stigma of being assigned male at birth but transitioning into a woman. I embraced this term because I had no interest in enduring a long, painful, and potentially dangerous medical transition. I was never going to conform to what the world or world considers a woman anyway, and I had no intention of trying. My goal in life has always been very simple, to live with as little pain as possible. It's a low bar to set for your, for your personal happiness, but I learned at a very young age that I was always going to hurt on some level. Being forced to live as someone you're not, even temporarily, has severe physical and psychological ramifications. 
you're going to endure some you're going to endure some permanent damage, much of it that will never truly heal. I had been living with this curse for over 35 years at this point. I'm facing the prospect of lifelong pain no matter what I do. So what would you choose? To endure the pain that you're used to or undertake an additional level of pain in what could easily turn out to be a fruitless attempt to alleviate your current pain? I knew several trans men, thanks to my social media connections, who were having severe complications due to their medical trans transitions complications that were costing them years of their lives trying to fix. Meanwhile, conversations with trans women about the various side effects of their transitions made the entire prospect of a medical transition unhelpful to me. And don't get me wrong, I utterly despise this piece of shit defective as hell body I got stuck with. The dysphoria here is high. However, it's not necessarily a gender dysphoria. That's part of it, but not the whole picture. I have birth defects that interfere with, basically, with basic bodily functions, defects that have led to symptoms of post-traumatic stress concerning these basic functions, forcing me to deal with doctors who undermine and even outright ignore the level of trauma I suffer simply because of this problem, because this problem continues to exist. I have severe levels of mental illness that require at the moment a half dozen meds just to manage. And even that is accomplished on a little more than a bare bones level. Overall, I'm on a dozen medications, regularly see at least eight different medical practitioners, and living on disability. This is all before any transition-related care I could undergo. If I did pursue a medical transition, I could easily pick up at least another half dozen doctors, none of which would matter anyway because the severity of my mental illness, my weight, and my lack of finances would probably disqualify me from receiving transition-related care anyway. At this point, gender dysphoria is little more than the cherry on top of a shit-covered Sunday. But, you know, God never makes mistakes, right? Hmm. This is the point where uh, it shouldn't surprise you to learn that I don't necessarily believe in a God. Certainly not a benevolent one, anyway, but I digress. This was supposed to be about the pulse shooting, right? So let's be clear here. I'm not directly affected by the shooting. I wasn't there. I didn't know anyone that was there. I just saw it on the news like the rest of the world. But even then, I took the attack personally. I took the pulse shooting, as well as the attempted attacks on pride celebrations that took place virtually around the same time, as an attack on me personally. It was the moment when I finally had to draw a line in the sand with my friends and family most of them being casually homophobic and all of them being transphobic on a violent level. In other words, they make a lot of gay jokes and they probably all try to kill me and use the trans panic defense to avoid prison. One in particular, his name was Chris, and I had known this guy since high school. He was for a long time considered one of my best friends. He was also an unapologetic right-wing nut job that constantly listened to Glenn Beck and whose paid membership helped make it possible for Beck's Blaze Network to exist. Obviously, I'm far more left-wing, but I had a policy when I came with Chris. Anytime he'd go off on his political rants, I'd nod, smile, and try to change the subject. Because, and this may come as a shock to many of you, but I'm not necessarily known for having this huge plethora of friends. So, you know, plus for the first 10 years, he was seemingly not so bad about it. Sure, he subscribed to bootstrap theory and believed that trickle down on economics actually worked, but it's not like he was rallying for the systemic extermination of an entire marginalized community until he was. At around the same time that I was starting to come out of my closet slowly, using the bisexual non-binary level as a sort of non-committal way of slowly trying to get my friends to accept the idea of me being trans eventually, Chris started posting all kinds of transphobic hate mongering stuff. He was ranting about the transgenders in bathrooms and supported various bathroom bills. He'd talk about how the transgenders are all mentally ill sociopaths and potential rapists. He'd share memes about how trans people were pedophiles. Basically, everything an alt-right dickhead with a hard-on for trans folk would share on social media. 
He's also a big gun nut. And every time there's a mass shooting, he's sharing in NRA names and talking about how more guns are the solution to everything. So being this gay bashing, trans hating, gun nut American that he is, he shares a meme from a group called the Pink Pistols, a gun advocacy group comprised of homosexuals. The, memes, the meme read, gays with guns don't get shot. As you can probably assume, this really pissed me off. I had for over a year watched as one of my best friends went from a mere white wing blowhard to a genocidal alt-right maniac. An alt-right maniac who I knew for a fact owned at least one handgun and could easily get access to an additional rifle without a problem. An alt-right maniac who had for over a year gleefully and rather openly talked about shooting trannies to stop them from preying on young girls in bathrooms. An alt-right maniac who I had to make my post invisible to for over a year because I honestly did not need this guy harassing me about my pro-gay, pro-trans, pro-feminist liberal agenda. Truth be told, I didn't need to have one of my so-called best friends calling me a beta cuck SJW snowflake and dragging me into an argument that I knew wouldn't accomplish shit because Chris wasn't going to listen to reason anyway. But then, seeing that pink pistols meme, gun, gays with guns don't get shot. Coming from the most potentially violent, transphobic person I know, someone I, who I saw over the course of a year become more radical, more hateful towards a community that he already knew on a level that I was a part of. He knew I was claiming the bisexual label. I saw this happening on my timeline, and I knew I had to respond. The response to his meme was fairly simple. I said, well, <laughs> that's all well and good, but do you know what else would assure that gays don't get shot? Not fostering an environment of hatred that condones mass murder of LGBTQ folk, a community that I just happen to be a part of. It was important for me to not only respond to his ignorant bullshit, but to remind him that I was LGBTQ. I never went into specifics of my identity. In fact, I left it intentionally vague because, again, I didn't want to engage in an argument that wasn't going to affect his position at all. He then asked me for my email address. Given the number of email addresses I've accumulated over the years, it's reasonable that he wouldn't have a current address to contact me, so I sent him an address. He then proceeds to send me a six-page letter of nothing more than hate-mongering, homophobic, transphobic talking points. Some copied and pasted directly from the American Family Association's, Family Association's website, while others taken word for word, word for word from the Blaze. Again, I'm familiar with Glenn Beck and the Blaze, thanks to Chris. So I recognize a lot of these talking points and where they're coming from. I also have a bad habit of looking into right-wing hate groups and their philosophy because it behooves one to know their enemy and their mindset. So he sends me this letter. I try to read the whole thing, but I can't. I skim through it. I see the familiar talking points. I do a, go a Google search to confirm my suspicions that Chris had just copied and pasted talking points from the AFA. That's about it. I make a special folder in my email account and store the letter there. I then immediately disengage from Chris. I block him on social media. I cut ties with him entirely. I then went on to write something of a manifesto of how I was going to handle my identity going forward. Up to this point, I was compromising my identity in order to make it more palpable for my friends at the time to understand what I was going through. I also sat back and watched many of them share homophobic and transphobic memes anyway, knowing that I was openly embracing the non-binary and bisexual label on social media and talking about it constantly. I figured that if I kept posting about my, ident my identity, about homophobia and transphobia, and tried to make gender nonconformity accessible to them, they'd eventually knock the shit off. Pulse changed that. Chris changed that. I wasn't going to sit back and let people talk shit about my community anymore in an attempt to slowly bring them across the line of human decency in an allegedly more peaceful manner. Most of them were lost causes anyway. People who were never going to come around because they didn't want to accept or understand it. 
I started confronting friends through social media, people I knew in my real life, and telling them exactly how this was going to go. I still wasn't ready to embrace a more accurate identity publicly, because I wasn't in an environment conducive of doing so. But I was confronting friends, and I was pointing them to social media accounts I had been maintaining as Daria, as I had been maintaining separate accounts for both Daria and the unfortunate misconception of an identity I once inhabited, while under the mistaken impression that I was a man. It was fairly, it was a fairly quick process. People's true colors shined immediately. I had friends tell me that the sexuality wasn't an issue, but the transness was. I cut a lot of people early because it was clear by their posts that they were lost causes. I also, I also, I was also very hard line about how I was handling this. There would be no ben more benefit of the doubt. There would be no more maybe. I made it blatantly clear. You either support my community 100% without question, or you can get the fuck out of my life. I'm no longer interested in peaceful coexistence with bigots. I am not Charles Xavier. I am not this naive putz that foolishly believes that all we have to do to stop people from being hostile towards us is to be nice to them. They don't care. They're always going to hate us, no matter what we do. We can kiss their ass until the end of the world, and they will always want us dead. This is me embracing my identity, compromised or otherwise. This is me not taking your shit with a smile anymore. I'm done being nice. I've gone full Magneto. You either accept that I exist and I'm entitled to the same basic, basic human rights and respect that you have, or you can fuck the hell off. Respectability politics will be the death of us, and I am no longer interested in pandering to your ignorance in order to get what I am entitled to by right, simply by the virtue of being alive. If Pulse taught me anything, it was that I was never going to be free until I braced the weight of the war ahead. I'm no longer playing nice. I will not censor myself to, confront, to comfort your ignorance anymore. This is the only way that I will ever truly be free. Um, it had been advised to me in my uh, attempt to become the performer I am now that sometimes it's a good idea to read something by someone else. By someone else. Um, of course, me, you know, you know, I, I think you meant another poet, but this is actually from a band and a song that I really respect and I think kind of works with my theme. Uh, the band is No Effects, and the song is called Concerns of a GOP Neophyte. Truth. Now, like viral infection, the GOP has developed a vaccine. Get your shots from the local Christian reading room. Make sure your clothes are blue and neoprene. Windows closed, television on, talk show, radio, where everyone agrees. The plague is here, but exposure is avoidable. Turn up mind, relinquish control. Question! Citizen questioning leader! Don't want to set a precedent? We're going to ask all the questions. Like, what kind of a patriot are you? Why did you check out the Trotsky? Why did your major malfunction? Traitor! To the Lord and Creator! Fucking communist faggot and an infidel lying among us, procreating liberal hippie, disgrace yourself in your country, why don't you love your lyrics? I wasn't thinking of me. I, I, I wasn't thinking clearly. I, my, my deepest apologies, I, I wasn't thinking of me. I, I wasn't thinking of me. I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking. Benevolence blinded, tolerance indicted. Why don't you love it or leave it? Forever, and uh, it is a 
series of poems about four phases of existence. This one is called Life. Dress rehearsals are for amateurs. Life is a stage and you are a player, the main character of a story that is your life, and the genre of your life is as ill-defined as your character. Your life has no discernible plot, and you're not, often not even the focus. The best lines always go to someone else mocking you. You don't even get a script. You have to improvise your way through this mess of a play called life, and you have to do it live every night with a new scenario every single time until the day you die. If your life was a book, it'd be practically unreadable. Assembled together by a, a team of incompetent writers, only one of which gets to be you. No proofreader, no editor, no publisher, no distributor. You might have a dozen readers at best and they only read the good chapters. Hey, look at me, I'm a novel that nobody reads. Because nobody wants to read the book. They wait for it to be made into a movie. A movie that's about as faithful to the source material as your ex-girlfriend who left you during pre-production to pursue her, pursue her career as the leading lady in someone else's studio feature. Your novel sucked, the movie's even worse, and you can't escape any of this because this is your life and you only get one take because dress rehearsals are for amateurs. Championship pencil, writing nights, sword fight champion. So, um, I need competition. <laughs> Daria needs competition. Daria is our uh, one of our undefeated fighters currently. So, um, October twelfth, we do have an actual feature. Uh, Dion D. Hunter. Uh, she was a writing nights regular before she moved to North Carolina, but she's back for a moment, or at least that weekend. Um, speaking about sword fights. For the uninitiated, picture a poetry slam mixed with a rap battle, mixed with a comedy act, mixed with a storytelling set, mixed with a UFC fight, mixed with a WWE show, and you'll get the idea. So, three rounds, uh, different lengths of the rounds, and then 10 point bust system, and then the winner wins. Then there's like a perpetual storyline going on for that too. Um, we do have one match scheduled for October 12th. We have uh, the Angry Cow versus Marissa Hyde, like the, he, the dude dressed as a cow, so it's going to be amazing. And uh, Marissa Hyde, who is from Kent and not here, I was hoping she would show up. And we are also looking for an opponent for uh, Kara Faluko. If you want to see some of our uh, sword fights online, you can go on to our uh, Red Knights YouTube page and see them there. Uh, November 9th, we have Francesco Faluko versus Gabriel Ricard, a case from Long Island. Um, we're also looking for additional sword fighters, and we're having a food drive that night, so you can bring in cans of food as admission instead of money, and all of the food will go to the Canton Sunday Picnic, which feeds hungry people every week on Sundays. Uh, December 14th, the next one after that, is uh, we're having a clothing drive for seasonal appropriate clothes, so like warm clothes, not like your booty shorts that you can't get rid of. Um, and all those Clothes are going to go to the Domestic Violence Project. Domestic Violence Project. Um, 
I'm skipping ahead a little bit to January 19th, day after my birthday. Uh, we're having an actual sword fight tournament, and the winner will not only get this lovely pencil, just three pounds of wood, but uh, we're also offering cash prizes. So $100 for first place, 75 for second, 50 for third, 25 for fourth. Uh, the deadline to enter that is December 15th. So if you find it and you're like, hey, I want to do this, then look for writing next online and you can enter. So do we have any do we have anybody who is interested in reading the mic? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it's in, the, in memory of 2nd Lieutenant David Rylander. Walking alone, endless chatter between the sweet pacifist thugs and our anarchist dark desire. Standing sentry, radical tree, gigantic hawk sits patiently waiting on me, seagulls fly free. Passing a lake, white swans and ducks, floating like dreams of hopeless, hopefulness, promise and trust. These things I lust. Far off, I, far off I hear a raven's black cheer, crackling crow as darkness grows. Hoot of an owl, a predator ready for f flight, seeking weak souls under cover of peaceful nights, hunting their prey, spreading, spreading their flight, fading twilight. Journey complete, moon rises as innocent sleeps. In the night, the joker creeps, for God protects. Sinners and saints, the doves and hawks, the righteous ones who seem to hate. The grief stricken who don't lose faith. Everything will shine. The puzzle of life will fit perfectly. A beautiful rhyme. 
It hasn't happened yet. I give and I get. Onward I go, dragging my feet, moving desperately slow. One thing I know, red roses die in the snow like love and letting go. Two months left, 
Numbers on our countdown calendar have been getting smaller and smaller by the week. It was such a relief to even be able to think about going home. I mean, like, the day was nothing special, the same 115 degrees out, and thankfully I'd gotten used to it for the most part, but this was one of our few days off. Our company commander had suggested it after a few intense weeks. My battle buddy, Carruthers, and I had <clears throat> come in from our night guard and were sitting in the mess hall waiting to for a much well-deserved breakfast. When the first car sergeant came in screaming and hollering as usual, they needed two extra bodies for a mission assignment. I nudged Carruthers. I was like, hey, we should probably do this. I mean, how many times has she voluntold me to go do random things? Like, for example, she voluntold us to go with safety scissors do area beautification, which means we cut grass. So, hurriedly we finished our breakfast and roughly had 30 minutes to get our salt packs together. All we knew was that there was an important man with, quote, vital information for the security and success of future missions and roles across the entire country. Her others called it word glitter, a fancy roundabout way the Army uses to make the reality of that we were doing absolutely nothing. So we rushed off to the Humvees. I jumped in the second truck. Carruthers got a big grin on her face and she just smiled at me and said, sometimes you just gotta grab your battle, battle buddy and say, fuck everybody else. This was just an old joke from basic and we both shared a laugh. The driver announced we were entering the hot zone so we both prepared for the next hours. We rolled into the city and I instantly knew something was up because there was no one there. Carruthers turned to me, she put a hand on my shoulder and said, no matter what, I got your back. Same to you, battle. <coughs> it was no sooner in that moment then we heard the turret gunner shout and the IED go off. The front Humvee had tripped the bomb. It was the largest, loudest sound I have ever heard. It was almost as if fireworks and every tree in the forest just blew off at once in front of your face, and then in your bedroom, and then lit everything on fire. There was a smell of diesel and gunpowder. In an instant, the market that was what I thought empty suddenly became eerily empty. <clears throat> Okay, next step was secure the area, but the shots rang out from the east side and peppered the side of the truck so we couldn't get out. So I pulled her out towards my side and we shared a look. It's kind of hard to describe what passes between the split second between a bullet flying by your face and staring at your best friend, but we knew that if something were to happen, we were going to be okay. More shots pulled us, pulled us out of our trance in her typical fashion. She just kind of shakes her head and she's like in a thick Minnesota accent. Just another day in the life of an MP, eh? <laughs> and I smiled back, nodding. The fire on the blown up Humvee was starting to settle, and in the midst of those blacks, we could hear a voice screaming, almost as if the blood was pooling in his throat as he called for a medic or for help. I turned my head in the direction, and I could barely make out his shape. Carruthers just looked at me, and she was like, we gotta go help him. I was like, no, 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 Army protocol says we stay here. I'm not gonna let him die if I can help. And with that, she just took off in a 200 yard dash. I didn't know what else to do, so I just followed after her. I began to provide covering fire over top of her. She managed to try to wrangle what she could between her shaking hands covered in blood and dirt and sweat and IFAC, this is our medic bag, to pull out a tourniquet to wrap over the man's legs. Both of them were gone. <coughs> Within the 20 seconds, that I managed to look up and see a man dialing a cell phone. Suddenly my entire body was shot through the air. My eyes shut, it was flung hundreds of yards, and when I opened again, my whole world had changed. I couldn't hear, everything was just a buzzing and a ringing, but what I could see was the body of my best friend in pieces. I could smell iron, I could feel something wet on my face, and I reached up and just saw that there was blood running down. I screamed a loud and painful scream and scrambled almost violently, almost without cause of my own body rushing over to her, but there was nothing, nothing left. And I just held whatever smangled pieces that I could in my arms and cried. By the time my unit had actually come to help us and secure us, I had passed out. The whole world just became black. Next thing I know, staring at bright lights of an army hospital. Okay, you don't have to clap. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? Uh, Ariana, you want to share? I have nothing today. You have nothing tonight? Just a beautiful right. presence. Just so beautiful. All right, so I will close out the nights with a couple three pieces.
Um, some of you may be wondering what my getup is all about. Um, periodically, I wear a, uh, a the, well, usually it's just like the cat ears, but um, it was a it was a common thing I would wear to the shows. And you remember Saraha, that thing that lasted maybe like 15 minutes, and people were all like leaving anonymous messages and stuff. Well, the first part of this is the anonymous message, and then my response to it. When you wear kitten ears and a little boy, you aren't making a statement on gender or freedom. You are just letting people know that you are too strange, too tall to. Most writers and speakers will dress in dark browns and blacks because they th the things they say are said with dignity and are more important than physical distractions. My response. I think little, wearing little boys and kitten ears is important to express gender freedom. I also feel it's good to let people know I'm strange, but I'm never too tall. What can possibly be more important than physical distractions, expressions, performance? And while many speakers choose dark brown and black, it is only because those colors are easy to keep maintained, they would never presume to tell another creator how to express themselves. Anyone who commits this kind of error is a true writer. Thank you. Um, this next one is based off of a Gwendolyn Brooks quote. It's quite, uh, from a poem, because I believe. The poem is, we are each other's harvest, we are each other's business, we are each other's mag magnitude and bond. And so this is my response to that. Your business is ripe for harvest, reddened tomato, squished to the brightness in the magnitude of the sun. You bind me like squash vines wrapped around sunflowers, pulling me to earth when I try to reach beyond my grasp. That's all for that one. One more piece. And then we'll close out the night. I don't know if anybody is on Facebook Live watching us, but hello if you are. So this is a piece I, I was cooking for a while, and it came out two Mondays ago, and I don't know how it is. I'm not an ally. Don't get me wrong, I don't hate you, I don't even know you, and I already like you. Your happiness is a concern of mine. I don't mind talking a little shit now and then, throwing out a few off-color jokes, because fuck political correctness. But I won't use disparaging words against LGBTQ or POC or women, but I'm not an ally. I will rage against machines churning our kids from playground to jail yard, from classroom into debt slavery. Our education is closer to mental domination, filling the heads of elementary, middle school, high school kids, college ki students with the imaginary dream that they'll be able to use their degree in their professional life. It's bullshit. I'm with you, but I'm not an ally. I'll defend you if some shit for brain bigot tries to fight you for being you. I got you. I'm not a giant, but I'll bite a motherfucker's throat out if I need to. I don't care if it's a cop or a drunk ass fool harassing kids on the corner. I'll put myself between you and trouble, or I'll watch you back from afar to let you handle your business, whatever you need. But I'm not an ally. You can't call yourself an ally, even if you are committed to a cause that isn't your own and willing to put yourself on the line, the people whose cause you are supporting are responsible for the designation of ally. It's like punk. Once you've called yourself punk, you aren't. It's up to others to say whether you're a punk, which is counterintuitive, I know. Who cares what others think about you? Hold that thought. It's like Zen. When you reach enlightenment, you just know, but the Tao is nameless, formless. Once you declare you've experienced the Tao, you've lost it. Hold that thought. Being an ally is like that. Act as if you don't give a shit what other people think. Ingrain in yourself the idea of being kind to people who treat their surroundings with respect. Empathize with the struggle other people are going through even if you can't possibly experience it. Defending to the death the lives of those who you love. When you act in balance without thinking, you have reached the Tao. You don't care anymore. 
And that is punk. And that is an ally. So if there's any more business, we do things here every fourth Wednesday. We do things up in Cleveland every second Friday. Um, come talk to me. We have books over there. The books, the books and t-shirts we have, they, uh, the t-shirts are only poetry can say, save you now on the back and on the other right, and it's a little on the front. And the books are mixed media and visually inspired, so they have pictures and words. So the best time to write is? Yeah. The best place to write is? Here. The best person to write is? You. Thank you. Good night.